The 90s was an important decade for Hollywood. Filmmakers like Steven Spielberg and James Cameron had ambitious ideas that were deemed impossible to film until they utilized a very important tool that revolutionized filmmaking forever, computer graphic images, or as we call it today, CGI. This changed the industry forever and inspired so many directors to use this technology in their films. And of course, it wouldn't be long until TV got their hands on it. However, it took a long time for television to figure that out, or really, until streaming came in. Yet live action shows weren't the first ones. It was actually children's television, and they didn't just use it as an effect, they used it as the entire animation. These CGI cartoons were very ambitious for the time, but obviously didn't age well. However, it didn't stop Marvel from trying, and boy did they try. Of course, those shows were eventually cancelled, rights were sold, and by the time of the early 2000s, Marvel Comics was pretty much dead. That was until the Ultimate Spider-Man comic came out. This modern day reboot launched a new line of books that brought new fans into Marvel Comics and kept them afloat for a little longer. Ultimate Spider-Man was successful enough to not only run for a decade and get a video game, but to be greenlit for an animated series. They had concept art and a pilot written by Brian Michael Bendis already and planned out. That was until a certain movie came out called... After the huge success that was Spider-Man, Sony immediately scrapped the show and wanted to cash on the popularity of the movie. But don't worry Ultimate Spider-Man fans, we eventually get that show. And of course they wanted it to be entirely CGI. This highly ambitious show would be known as Spider-Man, the new animated series. I, I see what you did there. The show would air in 2003 and was on MTV of all things. Of course I wasn't allowed to watch MTV because I was one at the time. But I eventually watched it on my first iPod and then got the DVD set when I was older. I have fond memories of this show and was always dumbfounded that it wasn't praised as much as the other Spider-Man shows. Some people don't even know about it. Finding this show was a struggle until Disney Plus somehow got it and spectacular as well. Seeing that it's the 20 year anniversary, I wanted to look back and see if it holds up to today's standards. So dust off those DVD sets and let's see if Spider-Man the new animated series still holds up. Now let's get the first thing out of the way and talk about the animation. Mainframe Studios were chosen to animate this show and they worked on a lot of shows like this before. So they had the experience and knew they had to make the show different from this. Uh, we found that the closer we got to realism, the creepier the characters got. They're sort of like stuffed, flayed people or, or marionettes, you know, Thunderbirds are go. And, and the closer we got to perfecting it, the more um, off it felt. So it was a very natural choice to say, let's go somewhere else. Let's let's uh, make a choice that's very graphic. So they chose to make it look like a comic book and cell shaded it. Cell shading is a very popular way to preserve any art style and make it look timeless. It's why the Ultimate Spider-Man game still holds up. And this was the right choice to make because this art style looks amazing. The colors are pleasant to look at, especially at nighttime. The shadows and that shading you have a problem? Yes, I have a problem. There's tons of inspiration from Mark Bagley's work on the character designs and huge inspiration from Tom McFarlane with Spider-Man's poses and the spaghetti webs. I know that this is a subjective opinion and some people don't like it, but you have to admit that for the time this came out, it was groundbreaking. Each minute took two and a half days to be completed and each episode is 21 minutes long. And seriously, look at the computers they had to work with. As for the animation, they actually used motion capture to make Peter's life feel more realistic, but that is only 30% of the show. All of Spider-Man's animation is keyframe, which is basically doing it yourself, and trust me, that's hard. For my final animation project, I decided to animate one of my favorite web slinging scenes myself, and it took me weeks just to get it to look like this. And it's not even half as good. 
This was a great choice because Spider-Man is actually moving fast as he's always been portrayed as in the comics. And I freaking love the web slinging in the show. He moves in a way that no 2D show was able to pull off before. To keyframe every scene with Spidey deserves a round of applause on its own. Seriously, congrats to these people. Now yes, I'll admit it hasn't aged gracefully and if I had to be picky, I do think some of the body proportions look weird in some angles. But it's what they had to work with, and I say they pulled it off. As for the characters of the show, we have our classic trio, Peter, MJ, and Harry as our main characters. Spidey is voiced by Neil Patrick Harris, and he surprisingly does a great job. His Peter Parker is nerdy and nervous. I, I know you'd like me to say more, but the thing is, sometimes words just aren't enough. While his Spider-Man is strong and heroic. Diamonds, girl's best friend. Glad you dropped in. We're gonna have a blast. Five seconds to recharge. Better make your next shot count. He does a good job separating the two instead of doing the same voice. And let me just say, it's nice to see Peter as a college student instead of a high schooler for the millionth time. He's struggling to pay rent, trying not to fail class. It's the classic Spider-Man formula, except it's mature now since it's MTV. Not many people know about Spider-Man's darker side, so it's nice to see a darker tone since all the previous outings were kid-friendly. Fun fact, they were gonna have Peter wear baggier clothes to hide his costume, but he weren't able to animate it folding all the time, so they just went with long sleeves and Bruce Banner pants. Mary Jane is voiced by Lisa Loeb, and she does a great job as well. Her voice matches the character, her design is based on the Ultimate comics, everything about her is great, except for the love drama. Yup, just like the movies, the love drama gets annoying with her being on and off with Peter, trying to pursue him, yet also giving him a hard time. It gets so annoying that when Peter does get a girlfriend, she still tries to get with him. I mean, she's not as bad as the movies, and I do like her, but she can be annoying in some episodes. Surprisingly, what's not annoying is Harry Osborn of all things. Ian Ziering's version of the character is very chill and relaxed. He's actually a good friend of Peter, and he only gets intense when Spider-Man is in the same room with him. And even that gets better development than what the movies did. Also, he's blonde for some reason. I don't know, I couldn't find out why. Those are the three recurring characters of the show. We don't have supporting characters that I can think of other than Jameson, who is not as good as the movies, and kind of a footnote, and Indy, who is an original character of the show and actually pretty cool. As for the villains, there are a few comic book ones like Silver Sable, The Lizard, Electro, and Kraven the Hunter. Fun fact, he was going to have his original costume, but they didn't know how to animate the fur, so they gave him a leather jacket. The rest of the villains are original characters as well. This was the usual thing for old comic book shows to do. We got cool ones like Turbo Jet, who's basically a redesign of Rocket Racer, and I totally dig this look. Shikata, who's based on Elektra. And a mysterious cat burglar who likes to flirt around with Spider-Man. Hmm, I wonder who this could be. Hi, I'm Cheyenne. What? Yeah, apparently her name is Talon and not Black Cat, even though she looks and acts like the character. I have no idea why they did this. One of the rumors is that they didn't want to use the real black cat because she was supposedly going to be in Spider-Man 2. I don't know, it's just weird. There's more villains, but we'll cover them later. Alright, so this show doesn't really have a serialized story like we're used to, so I'm just going to quickly go over episode by episode and tell you what I think about them. Oh, and I'm going in a canonical order, because if you didn't know, the broadcasting order is wrong. They had to release whatever episode was done, so that's how it aired. And now, that's the order on Disney+. Plus. So I'm going to put this here if you want to watch it the right way. The first episode features Turbojet, who serves as a contrast to what Spiderman is and how he claims to be helping people, but only caring for himself. His design and powers look cool, and I would definitely love to see this character again. In the second episode, Spiderman deals with Kingpin, but it's not just any ordinary Kingpin. It's Michael Clark Duncan. Yes. That kingpin from the Daredevil movie. Despite what you think about that, it's pretty cool to see this world establishing other characters and building up this universe. Plus, he has a stupid cane from the comics, all while Peter's trying to make it to MJ's play. Kind of familiar now that I think about it. 
Okay, so this one is kind of weird. We have a lizard episode, as every Spider-Man show does, and Dr. Connors is voiced by Rob Zombie. You heard me. Rob Zombie is in a Spider-Man cartoon, and I don't know why other than it was 2003. This portrayal of Kirk Connors is unique to say the least. He acts normal until he willingly injects himself, then starts acting creepy, spouting all about the animal kingdom, then starts to willingly transform to attack anybody that sets him off till he gets to Harry Osborn. Then accidentally kills himself. As far as the lizard stories go, not that great. But then again, not really much to do with the character. Still better than what the 2017 show did. A guy named Richard Damien wants to capture Spider-Man because he has a fetish. No, that's not a joke. That's the reason why. So he hires a huntress named Shikata. Apparently this was supposed to be Kraven, but they decided to use him later. She is a pretty interesting villain that leads to cool fight scenes, so no complaints here. Like I mentioned before, we essentially have a Black Cat episode, except it's Talon. And let me just say, her design just screams early 2000s. It looks like it came out of a spy movie rather than a comic book. Cheyenne and Harry get together after Bunge jumping off a bridge, which I think is legal, and this creates conflict for Peter who tries to change her for Harry, but ultimately fails to. Hey, bros before hoes, right? We finally meet Indy, a wannabe reporter who quickly becomes a love interest to Peter, and hot take here, I actually like this relationship. I know Peter and Mary Jane are a superior couple, except to Marvel, but it's like the landlord's daughter from the Sam Raimi movies, you know these two would work. Unfortunately, they're held hostage by Teradex, a terrorist organization led by Sergei, voiced by James Marster. They threatened to bomb the building and, wow, I can't believe they did this in 2003. Fun fact, one of the members is named Alexi. I don't know if it's a small reference to Rhino, but it seemed interesting to me. Anyway, another cool fight for Spider-Man. That's the bright side with most of these OC villains. They just serve as cool fight scenes. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about Christina who is voiced by Tara Strong. Huh, small world. She creates a mind-meeting device that goes wrong and brains are damaged to imagine Spider-Man constantly talking to her. So the villain of the episode is a crazy Spidey fan that goes too far. This is like pre-Harley Quinn where she's obsessed with the Joker, but there's no Joker. And this isn't like Harley Quinn where she can stand on her own. I think this is the weakest episode of the series. Mostly because MJ is still testing Peter to see if he's right for her even though he already has a girlfriend. The Party is a fantastic episode featuring Max Dillon. It's the nerd version of the character that the Amazing Spider-Man 2 movie did, but way better. He's a guy trying so hard to fit in and goes through so much pain until eventually he breaks and of course, somehow leads into Electro. Because of science. And actually kills the bully. Then he tries to kill everyone else because he sees nothing but the bully. It's a tragic victim episode that doesn't have a happy ending. It's a sad, but realistic take. The only negative thing I can say is Electro's design. It looks like it has a finished rendering. Still better than the movie. Hey look, another character from the comics. Fun fact, Aunt May wasn't in the show because MTV execs feared that, and I quote, that the appearance of an elderly people would deter their target youth audience from watching. Grandma. Hi, baby. Oh, 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 Anyways, Flash needs to get his grades up so he unknowingly signs up to be a guinea pig for a brain booster. That may have a side effect of weakening the subject until their bodies give out. This is why you always read the label, Flash. Also love how I'm catching the adult jokes that definitely flew over my head when I was a kid. For that? I'll make it so worth your while. God, help me in. Oops. That never happens. Peter gets caught in the middle of an assassination plot with Silver Sable. You know, for a character that's unknown to many people, she has been in a lot of things. No wonder Sony is trying to make a movie with her. It's a fun episode, but you can tell they had to reuse animation and locations. Although the show does acknowledge that. Electro returns and haunts Sally, that girl who briefly looked at him in the party. While at first a weak plot, it actually highlights his desperation and just shows how lonely he was. Electro tries so hard to turn Sally like him just to have someone to talk to. Alright, so these pair of villains are an interesting case. 
Nicola gains twins and happen to have psychic powers that control nearly anyone. Think of the purple man, but looking like they're about to recite an emotional poem to you at your local coffee place. Spider-Man defeats them and has to fight with some familiar faces again. It's kind of one of those highlight episodes, except they don't reuse footage. We finally see Kraven who immediately puts everyone close to Peter in danger. In an attempt to keep MJ safe, Peter reveals his identity to her, only for Kraven to kill her anyways. This of course angers him enough to listen to a stranger who convinces him to kill. And it's none other than Stan Lee. Kind of weird that his cameo is him acting sinister, but it's a unique one at least. This is all revealed to be a mind trick by none other than the Gaines twins, who plan to use Spider-Man to kill Kraven. This was a really cool twist that gives us villains that aren't just physically strong enough to punch Spider-Man, yet they end up being the most dangerous villains. Their origin is that Kraven killed their parents and that's why they want to use Spider-Man. It's admittedly a flimsy reason and they could have used anybody else. Like Daredevil, he would have never seen it coming. Anyway, Spider-Man nearly kills him until he realizes something is off. He manages to rescue MJ. But in an attempt to stop the twins, he accidentally hurts Indy bad enough to be hospitalized. This gets everyone in the city to hate Spider-Man, leading to a last and desperate attempt to finally stop them. Which of course, like all things in the early 2000s, wrap up with an explosion. While the villains are defeated, Spider-Man still loses. Indy's condition is unknown, everyone hates him, and Peter just gives up. Thus, Spider-Man is no more. And that's it! Show's over! No! Unfortunately, it got cancelled. And not because it did poorly. It did very well in the numbers. It's actually because MTV just didn't want to make the show anymore. And it sucks knowing they were planning on season 2 having more comic book villains and of course getting Peter to be Spider-Man again. But alas, it just wasn't meant to be. We didn't have to worry for too long though cause Spectacular Spider-Man would come out in a few years. Everyone who worked on the show went on to do greater things and I'm sure Neil Patrick Harris is doing just fine nowadays. I like to say that the show left a legacy because Marvel would try out CGI again with Iron Man Armored Adventures. And that show pretty much used the same art style and what if perfected it. While we're still getting animated Spider-Man stuff, they will never be like this show. This was truly a unique Spider-Man show that dared to be different from the others and actually pulled it off without annoying me. While I know the chances of this ever coming back is non-existent, I will always appreciate this show for opening the door to new possibilities and eventually, if I may be bold to say this, leading us to Spider-Verse. And yes, I would definitely love for him to appear in Spider-Verse 2. Come on Sony, make it happen! So that's all I gotta say about Spider-Man the new animated series. Go on and give the show a try, I'm sure you'll love it. And maybe next time we can finally review a certain classic that everyone loves. But until then... <laughs>